Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Conversations with IFS. I'm your host, Jemima Nunu, and today we're going to have an exciting journey on Ghana's economic history and development from a renowned professional. So before we do that, let's go on a quick break. Welcome back. As I said previously, we're going to be looking at Ghana's economic history and I have a very able and renowned personality to do so. Um, he's a former Vice-Chancellor of the University of Ghana. Prior to that, he was Director at the Brookings Institute in the US. And even before that, he was the Director of ISSE. He's been on various boards, he has contributed significantly to the economic development of our country through his writings and I think he's somebody that we'd all like to have our own personal conversation with. So, who's this person I'm talking about? Hello, Prof. Hello. How are you? Very good. Thank it's you very a pleasure much. to actually have you here in the studio to talk to you. It's my pleasure. So, um, you're now a retired um, former Vice-Chancellor. What does a former Vice-Chancellor do now? There's a lot that one can do. I spend most of my time on two things. I have uh, an engagement with the African Research Universities Alliance, ARUA for short, which is based in South Africa. So I spend quite a bit of my time in South Africa. Then the second thing that occupies me is I'm doing a book, writing my memoirs. A g another book? Yes, I'm writing a book about my life story. Ah. I thought I should do it now uh, rather than waiting uh, for another 10 years. Give us a so little, give us some tidbits. You know, I talk about myself. I, I try to explain why I have done th the things I've done. I know many Ghanaians have very different perceptions of who I am. Uh, there are those who think I'm a nice guy. There are those who think I'm a, a rough person. So it's my way of uh, indicating to the world who I really think I am and how I understand the way others perceive me. Uh, it's, a, it's a book intended likely for young people to understand some of the things that uh, the earlier generations have been through mm -hmm. and what makes them do the things that they, uh, they do or have done in the past. So it's, it's, it's a conversation with my grandchildren letting them know who their grandfather was or is. So that, that's how it's structured. So it's more about the person of... It's about the person and what he has done over the past, uh, especially 30, 40 years. So it's about the person and why he joined the academy. It's about the person and why he decided to do economics. It talks about my engagement with politics, in, not politics, but politicians. Mm -hmm. It talks about uh, my life at the university. Uh, beginning as a young researcher uh, to become vice chancellor, uh, how it was possible. You know, we live in a country where everybody thinks that the only way to climb to the top is to have a godfather, uh, or to lose somebody, or to be part of a political party. And uh, in a way, I want to disabuse people's minds of that idea. You can get to the top if you work hard enough. That, that's the philosophy behind the whole book. I look forward to it. I look forward to, to reading it. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. it it's yeah. also structured to be uh, very much a conversation. So it's uh, me forcing people to ask more questions about me and then looking for answers in the book. So I do hope that uh, when it's done, uh, those who read it will enjoy it. I hope so too. Um, also, um, since you've retired, you've received an award from the University of Sussex, an honorary doctorate nonetheless. Yes, yes. So you're a professor, doctor? No, no. Yeah. It's an honorary degree. It's an honorary. It's basically not expected that I'll be using any title as a result of that. Uh, it's a recognition by Sussex of uh, a lifetime in uh, university or higher education 
is uh, about the innovative success recognizing that African economists uh, do have something to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, they've made significant contributions to policy making in their countries. Uh, they've contributed to international debates. Uh, so in view of uh, these uh, things that I've been through or have been a part of uh, colleagues at uh, Sussex thought it good to recognize me for that. And I, I felt very proud of that, uh, the fact that uh, the works of Africans are being recognized by leading uh, global universities for me is a major uh, achievement. Is that something you feel strongly about, that African academics being recognized internationally, ju not just here on the continent, but worldwide? Sure. That's one of the things I tell my younger colleagues, that uh, whenever you think about yourself in the future, think well beyond Ghana. The world is a much bigger place than Ghana. Don't think about a Ghanaian audience. Don't allow yourself to be uh, forced to reflect only on Ghanaian views. Think about the wider world. Think about Africa. Think about the rest of the world. And think about what you can bring for the rest of the world to Ghana and to Africa. So I don't subscribe to the view that patriotism means only focused on national issues. You know, patriotism means placing your country at the center of the world. So how do you think your work has impacted um, beyond the borders of Ghana? You know, when, when I'm traveling and I meet a young Malawian student mm. that comes to me and says, Professor, I know you. And I look at him and I'm wondering where he knows me from. Mm. And he tells me that he's read my books or he's read my articles. That's when I get the most pride from. Uh, that's when I know that it's not only Ghanaian students who are reading my work, but Malawian students are reading my work. Mm. The fact that uh, I meet a central bank governor from another African country that says my views about financial development were formed when I read your book. You know, uh, so I'm very happy with the fact that uh, we've been able to reach well beyond the borders of Ghana. I'm very happy that uh, the African Economic Research Consortium made most of this possible through the network of African economists. Mm. So as a result of that engagement, uh, I'm glad that uh, most African economists are very well known to me that I know, uh, and, and then they know my work also, and they use my work. Oh, good. You've um, previously um, taught not only in Ghana, as we know, mm -hmm. but you've taught in Europe. And I just wanted to pick your brain. Uh, what exactly did you teach over there? And also, what were the reactions? What were the responses to what you were teaching? Very interesting question. Um, most of my engagements outside have been in the UK, where I taught at SOAS for uh, two terms. Uh, also in Germany, where I taught for a whole year. And then also in the US, where I've taught at three different universities. Um, most of what I teach is centered around the political economy of African development, the political economy. So I, I mean, these are young people who know what policies are. They know what the theory is, the theories of development. They know what these are. So it's not my role to come and introduce them to the theories of development. Uh, so typically, I've engaged them on uh, how African governments apply uh, development theories. So if we talk about uh, industrialization, for example, it's always nice to make them fully aware of how industrial policy has been perceived in Africa and how it's been pursued also in the region. Mm. Uh, it's then good to let them know what the global uh, leaders have thought about some of these policies, whether it's agriculture or you know, fiscal policy or monetary policy. Um, what they expected African governments to do and what the African governments did and explaining whatever differences there are between the expectation and the actual. So it's always been a very engaging, very uh, conversational kind of uh, engagement with, with students from outside. Uh, for many African students who sit in those classes, uh, they get a chance to compare what they have in their countries to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, I talk to, when I teach a Nigerian student in London, for example, it forces him or her 
to reflect on Nigeria, uh, but through different lenses. You know, and uh, that's how it's all being structured. Getting to know why Africans do the things they do and what have been the outcomes. Sometimes the outcomes are very um, negative. So you wonder why do governments do the things they do even though they know they will lead to negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's because they hope that they will achieve an outcome that defies anything that anybody expected. So um, I, I, I must confess I'm a former alumnus of SOAS. Um, so I know a lot of the intellectual debates that go yep. on there. Mm -hmm. um, so as you were teaching in universities like that where people are quite exposed, um, as you say, to the theories, and maybe you challenge the theories by, by, by stating what the practice was, mm -hmm. was there any backlash? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so a place like so is very interesting in the sense that uh, not only do they come from different backgrounds, but they are exposed to ideology quite early. Uh, th th there are two sides to it. They can be good and it can be very bad. It can be good in the sense that uh, the students have a fairly good opinion about what they want. Uh, it can be bad it also in the sense that uh, sometimes they take an entrenched position on issues. Mm. Uh, so my job as the lecturer is to force them to be more open-minded. And look, this is what you believe, but the world is a lot more different from what you believe. Uh, and I they proceed to give them illustrations of why the world is different. Sometimes you're able to convince them, other times it doesn't work. And that's the way the world is. Okay. Um, also, you know, do you think that as an, an African or a Ghanaian academic mm -hmm. teaching these theories and practices of development, you have more to offer, you have a different perspective than maybe the ones like that taught me that were mainly European and based in Europe. What do you, what fresh perspectives do you think you can offer? Oh, a lot. Um, so typically when I've taught, uh, I've used books from all over the world. I've used articles from all over the world, including from Africa. So you, you, you're able to give a student a more balanced view of the world. And you're talking from your own experiences. So, so when I talk about, when I talk to students at SOAS or at Yale or at Swarthmore about uh, the policy making processes in Ghana, yeah. I'm not talking about something I've read. I'm talking about things I've lived. Yeah. So it's a lot more uh, friendly. It's, it's a, a lot more engaging. The, the students are more or less given a, a chance to live with the reality of your, ex your own experiences. So when you talk about meetings with the finance minister and the kind of things you discuss, for them, it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that uh, you are you're able to engage in a debate with the finance minister, it, it's a quite reassuring for them. And uh, it, it makes them begin to think about policy making uh, not being simply something that uh, a few people sit in their room and discuss and do, but it's something that could be more open, uh, allowing for inputs from other places. Of course, I know that life is not always that straight where everything is open and subject to contestation. Uh, there are many things in Ghana that one could change to make it even more open and more transparent. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, just to, you've just wet our appetite, but we have to go for a, a quick break. So when we come back, we'll move on to discuss um, inclusive growth in Africa. Stay tuned. Welcome back. So let's carry on with the conversation with Prof Aite. Prof, before you became the Vice Chancellor, you were the director of the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute. Um, I'm sure that must have been a very stretching and demanding job. Um, but recently, um, I think in January, they came out with a report on the top priorities 
for Africa for um, inclusive growth. I was just wondering, what are your, in your opinion, what are the top priorities for Africa and African countries to pursue for inclusive economic growth? You know, when we first used the expression inclusive growth about a decade ago, uh, our minds were sort of focused on the fact that um, there are quite a few African countries that had experienced fairly significant growth over a, a period, uh, in many cases for four to five years. But while the growth was occurring, you could see also uh, poverty um, quite acute in some of those countries and in for many others inequality I mean in a place like Ghana inequality was emerging and growing very fast so the issue was what kind of growth would bring along the poor what kind of growth would uh, leave nobody behind as they today you hear people talking about that's when we began to look into what the, were the real sources of the growth that we were experiencing a decade ago. Uh, and you found that most of that growth was coming from uh, public sector activity. Most of that growth was coming from services, uh, high-end services that had nothing to do with the poor. Um, so the natural follow-up question was, what would we do to ensure that growth came from the other sectors uh, that would very likely involve the poor? So something like agriculture. Mm -hmm. That's where the majority of the people are. That's where you find most of the poor people. So if you didn't do anything about agriculture, the, the likelihood that you'd be able to uh, uh, drag others along with the, the growth trajectory was very low, or very limited. So you've got to do something about agriculture. But what about agriculture? Exactly what do you do about agriculture to make sure that it benefits a much larger uh, cross-section of your population? Uh, so you, you probably would have heard about talking about modernizing agriculture. That's one of the areas that Brookings is very, very interested in. Mm -hmm. How do we modernize agriculture? Modernizing agriculture means linking agriculture up with the industry and also services. You know, so you can modernize agriculture without looking at its link to industry. So the, the, the issue of uh, inclusive growth for African countries requires a much broader perspective on uh, how uh, you organize your economy. By all means, you need growth. By all means, we must pursue growth. But not all growth is good. That's the important point we make. Mm -hmm. Not all growth is good for the poor. It would mean require additional effort on the part of the state uh, to bring the poor along. So which kind of growth, I'm following on from mm -hmm. this, which, which kind of growth is not good? Uh, I'm quite sure that many economists will uh, dispute this particular point about uh, so not all growth is good. Well, well growth is good. Growth is uh, uh, generically good. And when the growth is skewed, uh, and when the growth is coming from very uh, narrow sections of the economy, uh, let's say oil and gas, and there's no means for redistribution, mm -hmm. that is really of no use to the poor. So whether growth is good or bad, it, it depends on uh, how the redistribution uh, it, it occurs. So that, that's the point I'm trying to make over here. So if you have a country where the means for redistributing growth, uh, the means are not there, uh, the growth is of no consequence to the poor. Uh, that's a, a, an important distinction that we need to make. We need to think more broadly about how growth can occur. And uh, in doing that, things like structural transformation that come in, um, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about structural transformation. Yeah, we've talked a lot. Uh, and it's a very difficult thing to pursue, but you can't also move forward without doing it. You can't move forward simply by talking about it. It, it, it calls for compromises one way or the other, but it calls for commitment. It calls for um, people having to make adjustments to the way they live. Uh, I know that you are interested in uh, the fiscal policies. It calls for more radical fiscal policies. Uh, it calls for redistribution in a manner that is going to encourage more growth. So uh, transformation is important. Until we do it, we will always be dependent on uh, aid. Until we do it, we will always be dependent on a short-term 
uh, outcomes. So what are the key sectors that you think um, can enable this transformation? You know, uh, I've always worried about the fact that um, we haven't paid enough attention to the link between agriculture and industry. Um, I don't know how you're going to deal with uh, the huge employment challenges that we have if we don't focus on that link between agriculture and industry. So you've got to improve agriculture, you've got to improve industry, but even more important is how the two are linked. So, of course, it means processing of uh, goods, for example. It means more modern ways of producing. It means that uh, you're going into manufacturing, manufacturing that is linked to uh, agriculture, using uh, local inputs and so on. These are the areas. We, we tried that back in the 60s with our import substitution uh, uh, policies. It didn't work for several reasons. And because uh, it didn't work, we then gave up. Today, we don't have anything like an industrial policy. They, we don't have anything that you can call an industrial policy that reflects the kinds of interventions that we want to uh, make as a nation in order to foster the industrial sector. So, oh, so what I'm getting is you're looking at agriculture as the key, but actually linking it up in a whole value chain. Precisely. So, you know, looking at it in terms from, they call it from, from fertilizer to fork, hmm? the whole yep. value chain. Yep. Uh, that could be used as a catalyst to transform the economy. Yeah. That, 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 that's the point, really. That's the point. Until we develop a, a strong link between our agriculture and industry, uh, we are not going to solve the, the structural problems that we have. So apart from agriculture, what are the other top priorities? No, I mean, uh, it's not a simply a matter mm -hmm. of apart from agriculture. Agriculture is the main thing. Agriculture's link to industry is a major thing that has to be pursued. Mm. But the, the uh, more or the, the other uh, policies that you need to support that will be the type of uh, fiscal policy that you put in place. Uh, who are you going to tax more to generate more revenue in order to finance your agricultural investments? What are you going to do to excite investors to move into agriculture? Uh, what are you going to do to more encourage people to move more and more into manufacturing? These are the things that uh, any uh, policy maker uh, looking for transformation should be focusing on. How do I get people to put their money into agriculture? And that's what I was going to ask you. Mm -hmm. How do we make investing in Ghana more attractive? How do we, you know, woo, woo people to come and invest here? The, the environment is important. Uh, assuring people that uh, their money will be safe is very important. And I think we, we, we've begun to do some of that. Uh, but more important, making them fully aware that uh, if they invested in the sector that we are interested in, they will uh, get their money back. They will make significant returns comparable to anywhere in the world. That's a very important part. Um, so, of course, it goes then to what kind of incentives are you offering for mm -hmm. people to go into agriculture. Um, we, 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 as a nation, believe that uh, agriculture is important, mm -hmm. and I've heard a lot of every agriculture minister talk about that, and that it, it should be so. But I haven't seen the incentive packages uh, that are supposed to encourage them to want to go into agriculture. I haven't seen an incentive package that would convince a, a, a non-farming household to want to put its money into agriculture. Um, where by incentive, I'm talking not simply about taxes, but the infrastructure, for example. What would make a young graduate from Accra want to travel to Agona Suedru and uh, put hundreds of thousands of cities into agriculture? There has to be something. Somebody got to think about the kind of uh, packaging uh, packages that we need to make that happen. Okay, I'm sure you'll be still, even in retirement, you'll be there on hand to offer some of the, um, proffer some solutions to these kind of... I mean, the, the, the solutions are not new. Clearly, uh, the, the fact that uh, you require a proper land tenure arrangement to make people want to go into agriculture has always been known. The fact that you need proper irrigation investments made by the state or whoever 
has always been known. Uh, the fact that the banking system has got to provide credit for agriculture has also always been known. The, the problem in this country is that we approach these solutions in a piecemeal way. And when they don't yield the results we are looking for, then we decide that they are not good enough. I'll give the example of irrigation. Uh, back in the 70s, when we discovered irrigation, there was a lot of investment uh, in irrigation in northern Ghana, for example. Um, we didn't plan them properly, and uh, the type of irrigation that we pursued was not necessarily the best. And we, and we didn't manage these projects very well. And because they didn't deliver the outcomes we were looking for, today nobody talks about irrigation any longer. Uh, but without irrigation, you don't do you can't transform agriculture. You know, so you got to find out what's the best way to do irrigation, not whether you need irrigation or not. And it's important that we deal with these issues. The fact that you made a mistake in the past doesn't mean that that should not be tried again. So what you're proposing is that we go back to basics almost. What I'm proposing is that we learn from our mistakes. We made mistakes in the past. We've got to learn from them and improve on how we do things, not simply abandon them. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're now in the second decade of the 21st century and I want you to tell us what do you think are our basic growth trajectories? How do you think Africa and Ghana in general, what's the direction we're heading? How are we going to grow? You know, uh, let's start with Ghana. Ghana has been growing decently since 1988 growing decent. Ever since we began structural adjustment, uh, we've had fairly decent growth on most occasions higher than the African average. Uh, the kind of wild, the wild swings that we used to see in the uh, growth performance are uh, no longer there. The only problem we have with growth is that even though we are experiencing decent growth or we experience decent growth over a long period, uh, the problems that need to be tackled with the outcomes of growth are also growing equally fast. So you don't see the uh, effect much in terms of uh, welfare, in terms of uh, people's uh, living standards and so on. That, that has always been the, the problem. Now, so the question becomes, how do you achieve even faster growth um, fast enough and strike it in a manner to bring along everybody or as many people as possible. That, and that situation is also being observed in other African countries, whether it's in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, uh, Uganda for a long time. You know? So how do you ensure that the growth that is occurring can be even faster and more widespread? coming from many different sectors, not simply driven by public expenditures, as we've seen in uh, many places. So the uh, issue of what type of growth has to be discussed properly. Mm. How do you get more sectors? You don't, want, you don't want growth that is driven simply by developments in the, in the services sector, where the services sector uh, is also being driven by investments that are not likely to have any meaning for uh, young people, investment that are not likely to have any meaning in terms of employment generation. So that's the kind of thing that we need to look at. Let's focus on determining which areas we want the growth to come from. And as I've said earlier, uh, the fact that agriculture industry must play significant roles cannot be ignored. Thank you. I think now it's time for us to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking about Professor Aiti's key research area. Don't go away. Welcome back to Conversations with IFS, brought to you in collaboration with GH1 and the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Prof, 
Welcome back again. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to move the conversation into an area which I know is very dear to your heart, and that is the whole overall fiscal management of the Ghanaian economy. Um, you have a book that's recently come out on the, econom the economy of Ghana 60 years after independence. And I'd just like you to take us on a journey um, with regards to the economy over the past 60 years and how we fared, especially in our fiscal management. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what this book does is um, it explores the link between the different policies that we've pursued in this country for different sectors and different areas uh, and also look at the outcomes uh, from those uh, experiences. The best way to look at the main message from the book is simply what I say, good policies generally lead to good outcomes and bad policies also lead to bad outcomes. Um, when you read the book, whether you are looking at the uh, fiscal management or monetary policy or the trade policy, industrial development, you know, any of the different sectors that uh, can be discussed in any book on the economy, you find that uh, um, the outcomes were not simply unique to one government or the other. From 1957 to 19, uh, or let's say 2017, that 60-year period, you find that all Ghanaian governments had episodes of uh, good policy and good uh, outcomes and then also bad policies and bad outcomes. So when we talk about uh, bad policies, which are not uh, unique to any one government that we've had in this country, uh, we are simply referring to a situation where governments know they don't have the resources to pursue particular programs, and yet they, they go on an expedition uh, trying to do exactly what they can't afford to do, leading to outcomes that we've always known to be uh, very negative, uh, high inflation, etc., etc. So um, what the book does is it documents how in the, in, under different regimes, we've had different types of policies. Mm. And, uh, discusses in detail those policies and then shows outcomes that are linked and, uh, to those policies. Uh, it's based on research that has been done over many years by the authors themselves or by people that they, they know and uh, things that have been published. So it's a very good document or documentation of Ghana's very rich history and uh, it, it clearly shows you that when we be minded to do the good things, you spend the money that is available to you only. Uh, and even if you have to borrow, uh, you, you borrow wisely. Uh, you borrow from places where there's some uh, leverage in terms of uh, what, can, what it can be used for bringing about change and so on. Uh, that has very well been documented in this book. Um, so the, whether it's the discussion of uh, agriculture, uh, industry, gender, uh, mining, uh, oil. It tells you exactly what our experience has been. Good policies leading to good outcomes, bad policies leading to bad outcomes. We made the point in there that um, governments don't pursue bad policies simply because they are bad people. Uh, uh, we make the point that uh, bad policies can be the, out, the, the result of uh, um, very badly structured decision-making processes. Mm. So if you have bad, uh, not well-informed people advising you, then very likely you have policies that you can't uh, defend in any uh, significant manner. So we, d we show what happens to health. We, 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 there, are, there are different discussions of uh, health outcomes in, can in Ghana. Uh, we show when you go to agriculture, when we've done very well in agriculture, 
uh, what have been some of the policies that we put in place, supporting infrastructure, infrastructure for agriculture, mm -hmm. supporting fertilizer use, supporting research. We show all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important thing in all of this is that uh, in the years when fiscal management uh, has been very bad, the outcomes have been horrible, also for Ghana. And it runs through many different things. So what, why haven't we been able to uh, redo do the uh, fiscal restructuring properly? Because it is costly. Um, we, we, the basic problem on the fiscal side is that we've tended from year to year, especially when we're going to have elections, mm. uh, spend far more than we've managed to mobilize in terms of revenue. Uh, why haven't we been able to mobilize more revenue? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recurring problem. We haven't been able to do that largely because we have never properly engaged with new forms of taxation. Uh, we've never properly engaged with new forms of taxation. So we've always sought to get a lot more out of the old forms of taxation. It is the same people, the same businesses, the same individuals that we want to tax. Uh, we've never properly engaged with diversifying properly uh, the uh, tax net. We've never properly engaged with how, to, how do you tax aspects of agriculture. Mm -hmm. We've never properly engaged with the issue of how do you tax land and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that will give us additional revenue, we haven't. So until, and these are structural issues, mm -hmm. uh, these are political economy issues. What, what is the politics of taxing land? for example, in rural areas or in urban areas, they, they require some discussion. They require debates. They, they require political engagement. And we wouldn't do it because it's difficult. And it's, it's very dis uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, but it has to be done. If, if, you, live, if you live in a, a part of the world where your biggest resource or your big, or most significant resource is land, and uh, you would not tax the, out, the, 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 the land, you, you would not tax ownership of the land, you have a big problem. They also they, think they, 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 There are ways of doing it in which uh, uh, you don't penalize people. But you, 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 you should use tax as a way of incentivizing people to do investments. If I have land, if I have land, I have uh, 10 acres of land somewhere in the central region. And it's lying there. I don't invest it. I don't borrow to invest. I don't do anything to it. But it's just lying there because uh, I don't know what to do with it. If I was being taxed for owning the land, I'd be forced to think creatively about what to do with it so to generate income for me so I can pay the tax. You know? So until we begin to think uh, very innovatively about these kinds of things, we are not going to have structural change. Yeah, well, that involves a lot of very difficult conversations. Definitely. And you, you, um, you can't have structural change without difficult conversations. And yeah, and also I think maybe the political costs as well might be very difficult to bear. Yes, but people have to understand that you want employment, you want improved welfare, you want improved health, improved education. It's not going to come simply from maintaining the status quo. So, Prof. And it's important that politicians learn to tell the people that. So. What, looking over the, the past 60 years, what fiscal policies have worked, or in your words, uh, good policies, and which ones haven't worked? You know, uh, basically, it's about revenue mobilization and uh, the management of public expenditures. These are the two things that uh, are involved here. Um, there hasn't been anything that one, let's, if, it, if you take the expenditures, um, what we've done from the time of a structural adjustment has been to ensure that uh, we are prudent in our spending uh, from time to time. And uh, when we've managed to uh, maintain uh, a good uh, oversight of how public expenditures are being made, we've been rewarded with fairly decent macroeconomic outcomes. Uh, when we've not uh, spent uh, well beyond our means, when we not spent money that we didn't have, when we don't want to borrow from the central bank and others to uh, engage in huge spending, we've never had any problems there. But when we've 
reverse the situation. When, when, when I, I remember back in the um, 80s and, uh, and 90s, we had all these extra budgetary uh, expenditures that were being made when governments uh, would spend money uh, outside of the budget. Uh, well, be, you know, th those things always create problems. I think we've cleaned up a lot of that. Uh, we've cleaned up a lot of that. We've imposed through Parliament a lot of uh, uh, measures that uh, compel government to uh, be a lot more prudent in the way it engages. So we, but there have been, and as we've always also said, uh, there have been occasions, especially before elections, where we don't manage that properly. And so, and we, Basically, we, we spent three years cleaning up and then uh, a whole year, well, one year to simply destroy everything again. And, and that has always been the problem. On the revenue side, as I've said earlier, uh, we have always talked about uh, expansion of the uh, revenues of the, the state. Um, we have very seldom been able to achieve the targets that we've given ourselves. Um, and that comes largely from the fact that uh, uh, many things happen which make it difficult for the state to realize its uh, expected tax uh, uh, income. Um, and when that happens, we, we've always been forced to finance the deficit that is ensuing uh, using the uh, banking system. That has always been a problem. So, yes, uh, when we've behaved well, We've been rewarded with good outcomes. Okay, that's a, that's a lesson. And also, um, what have been our main fiscal challenges? Yeah, you talked. We've talked a bit about overspending mm -hmm. um, in the past, mm -hmm. but are there have been other fiscal challenges that we've had to? The, the other main thing is, is on the revenue side. It's mm -hmm. mob mobilizing revenues, oh. and we 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 we've not done very well with them. Okay, so presently our current fiscal management, mm -hmm. how would you assess it and how do you think we, we will be going on in the future, our future projections? I think on the expenditure side, uh, things are on track. I, I don't have any difficulty with how the fiscal, the, 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 the expenditure side is uh, uh, being handled. Uh, we, we have challenges on the revenue mobilization side. And uh, if you read the budget carefully, uh, it shows you clearly uh, the challenges that we are having over the uh, last year, the revenue targets were not met. Mm. Um, will they be met this year? I do have my doubts about that. So the, 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 the what government needs to focus on now is how to generate additional revenues, not simply by uh, taxing the same old uh, uh, sources but thinking more creatively about new and additional uh, sources of revenue. And Prof, the reason why I go back to the difficulty is no one likes to pay tax. And tax is yes, a and very no one, And no one likes issue. to pay even more tax than they are paying. And it's a very thorny issue. Yes. So when we talk about always increasing the um, revenue net or the tax net mm -hmm. and thinking creatively about it, do you have any concrete examples of maybe countries that have managed to do so in a way that is not so biting? No, it's not. Uh, th there are countries like India where agricultural taxation uh, prevails, uh, where taxes on certain types of land. You know, it's not simply a, a, a matter of which countries are doing what. It's more an issue of studying your own environment. The resources are available to people. Uh, how you can use tax as a mechanism for inducing a change in the way they relate to that resource. Mm. You know, tax does not have to be seen as a punishment. Tax does not have to be seen as a way of taking away from people. Tax should be a used to signal the direction in which the state wants to uh, uh, go, that actually wants to go in order to bring about change. So you tax things in order to induce a change in behavior. You know, uh, the problem in many de developing countries is because we have misused tax revenues uh, in some places, 
the tendency has been to look at taxation as a way of taking from uh, the poor to uh, look after the rich. Why shouldn't it be? So, so of course, you've you got to inspire confidence in people. You've got to make them believe that taxation is for, uh, for a worthy purpose, that the cost for which they are being taxed is a one that uh, they should uh, easily buy into. Now, you can't go and tax a poor farmer who has a, a small hectare of land. But taxing a chief who has several hectares of land for the land, there's nothing wrong with it. It forces the chief to think more about development. It forces that chief to think about investments. It forces the chief to think about how can I put this land to work. So let us disabuse our minds as a people of taxation being an instrument for punishment or an instrument. It should be an instrument for inducing behavioral change. I give you, I give you another example in uh, 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 urban areas. You know, you go to places and you buy land, you buy land in Accra, and then you leave the land there, and you go and live in uh, New York or live in London. You just leave the land there, maybe two, two acres of land, and you live in, the, in a, a good part of Accra. As you think about how one day you find money to come and develop it, and the land is there. That land has value. But its value is not being realized. That land could easily generate employment for the people if there was some development on it. So the land is being allowed to lie there for 15 years, 20 years, not being developed because there's no cost to mm -hmm. the, the, the landowner. You know? When you begin to provide taxes on these kinds of land, the owners are forced to think about how they can turn that into an income generating asset. Okay. Plenty to think about. Prof, thank you so much for coming on Conversations with IFS today. We have had an interesting journey on not only about yourself and what you're pursuing, but about the economic history of Ghana. Um, I would encourage our viewers to read up a little and perhaps, you know, purchase a book or read up about our, our economic history. It is quite interesting to say the least. So Prof, we hope to have you back in the near future again, maybe to talk about your memoirs that you're currently writing. And to the viewers, stay tuned because next week we'll have another exciting conversation with another renowned personality. Thank you for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye.